Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender. If you work in HR or make people decisions in your organization, this is the place to be. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. All right, today is episode 48. We're going we're gonna to hit 50 pretty soon, and so am I. That makes two of us, three of us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Awesome. We, we, you guys know we have a guest today. We have Mr. Eric Isle joining us today. We're going to talk about all sorts of things from human-centric workplaces to work-life balance to, uh, to DJs and characters and storytelling. And maybe we'll be drunk by the end of it. Who knows? Who knows? Today's agenda. Um, I don't think we have any newbies today, so we won't be doing that. Um, and you guys all know the the resources that we have available. Um, so I'll skip straight to the news. So this happened this week. Google pushed their work from home to June 30th, 2021, next summer. You know, it was just a few weeks ago <clears throat> when I think Yvonne was the first person to say out loud that 2020 was pretty well cooked from a work from home perspective. Um, and it didn't take but two weeks for a major player to basically blow that out another six months. I was, I was on a board call this morning and it was just interesting to listen to the perspectives of the folks on that board talking about what they're hearing as well. And, you know, what started off as this is going to be a few weeks. I, I think people are now starting to accept the fact that this is, this is what it is for and a I, while. I kind of appreciated that Google um, took sort of the aggressive move to align with the school year calendar because yeah. of the chaos that is what is happening in the schools um, to give, to give their employees some predictability around that to say, well, right. We don't know what the heck's happening at school, but I know where I'm working. So right. that helps people make decisions. Yeah. And, and uh, I saw just before I got on the call that uh, DPS announced their remote through October. Okay. So. Yeah. That's a day by day thing right now. It's yeah. It's <clears throat> Yeah, I still think that's the hardest problem to solve, right? Just the tactical nature of that problem is really difficult. Mm -hmm. So uh, my team doesn't know this, but I'll tell them on Friday that, that Cable Apps is going to announce we're going to work from home through June 1st or January 1st, at least. Mm. And then at reassess. least. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think more and more more and more companies are going to start playing a longer game, and that was <clears throat> that was the kind of the crux of the call uh, that board call I was on this morning, um, is just uh, just that right that that the the long game is the safe game to play at this point in time, and trying to make sure that that we're we're taking all that into consideration and 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 making decisions accordingly. Cause I think making these short decisions has led to like all this uncertainty and employee unrest that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. All right. <clears throat> well, speaking of that, in the spirit of, of the conversation that we're gonna have with Eric today, I was wondering, so what are you guys actively doing right now to try to balance the demands of work and life? Are you sticking to the things you started off doing? Have you slipped into new patterns? Are you doing things now that you maybe weren't doing before? I'm just kind of curious where everybody is in terms of filling their own bucket uh, and still getting stuff done. I, I posted an article on the Bartender Network today <clears throat> about companies that are forcing technology companies that are that are forcing folks to take time off uh, mm. companies that are doing things like one company blocked everybody's calendar from two o'clock onward every day oh. just for a period of time and then they switch to uh, blocking every Friday for everybody you only work four days a week because people are killing themselves and they're not taking vacation so they're not filling their buckets 
right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, their, their productivity <clears throat> isn't as great um, because they're, they're not as, as thoughtful or as energized. So I'm just kind of curious. I know, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? I've kind of, I've been thinking about this so much the past couple of weeks, and I may have mentioned it last week as well. And we've talked about it internally about this notion of not being in routine. And we've built these routines in our lives over years and years of how we take care of ourselves, the things that we do, the places we go, all of these routines and, and ways of doing things that have shifted. And we haven't yet got back into a routine or gotten back into a routine. So maybe some of you have, I feel like right now my my cycle is I I played a short game. I think initially like, okay, I'm going to do these things for a few weeks and, and it's going to look different. But now it's like, I love that Google has started to play this longer game. So they know that they have more time and they can start to actually get into routine. So I guess for me personally, I, I kind of did something short term, but I'm actually at a lower place right now where I need to, I need to make some changes, especially on the, the physical piece, I think, getting up and, and sitting different places and those sort of things. There's an article I saw <clears throat> today that I think Morag posted it after Tasha Yurik posted it. It was about hitting the COVID wall. Did you see that on LinkedIn? <clears throat> it's the gal who's the CEO for Water for People here in town. And she just tells her story about hitting the wall and the things that she's doing now affirmatively to, to, to keep herself away from that. And I thought it was really interesting because her net net was, I think I'm becoming a better person mm-hmm. because of this, which I thought was kind of cool. That's good. Yeah. What else? Well, I've started a new commute, which is to walk around the neighborhood before I start work versus falling out of bed and just going straight to the desk. Um, and the other one was I've reinvented my airplane time, which was my downtime and rethinking. And so I've blocked every other Monday afternoon and every other Friday afternoon where I'm going to be offline. And whether I choose to be at my desk or go and do something else, I've got to get those patterns. So it's not as every week, which is what it used to be when we were traveling, yeah. but it's at least a something that will allow me to decompress from the running that we've all been doing. Yeah. And if you want to be true to that paradigm, then you need to watch Law and Order on your laptop. I do. Ching, ching. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Morag. What else? What about folks that are <clears throat> that are in active searches that are trying to figure out where, when to put credits in the bank on, on the job search front and when to put credits in the bank on the, on the filling your own bucket, personal wellness piece. I mean, definitely getting outside has been hugely helpful. I've done probably more yard work right in the past month than I had three or four years previous. <laughs> I just get some stuff cleaned up, but you just take it as it comes. I'm also filling up more waste buckets uh, around the house because mm. now that they're I am more free, right? And more available to assist, which is perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> and then my youngest will be a junior um, in high school. So every other day we try and do something outside and then grab a little lunch, whether it's social distancing or six feet kind of a deal. So just a little bit of everything, including, that's right, including looking for a new position. Forgot about that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Millsy. Yep. Lindsay, it looks like you just came yeah. off the mat. Well, I would just add to that. We've talked a lot um, in this group about, you know, almost giving permission and giving yourself permission. And so I think that one of the things that I've tried to do is give myself permission that if it's a, a day where it's not coming together, that it's okay to do like what Darnell was talking about and go outside and, you know, maybe do some yard work and then come back to it um, as opposed Mm -hmm. to really staying regimented to that schedule and almost letting it evolve organically um, as opposed to being so set. Yeah, I think that's a big deal. I mean, I know for people that are like me, I'm a, I'm a disc C <clears throat> that structure is so important to me. And I feel like I'm cheating on myself when I'm not doing it the same way or working when I'm supposed to be working. Um, <clears throat> even though I don't feel, <laughs> I don't feel bad or good or anything 
when I'm sitting here working at, you know, 1030 or 11 o'clock at night, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm, I'm putting credits in the bank. I'm just doing whatever I want to do. And, but if I go out in the middle of the day, I still feel guilty, which is dumb because it's all created by me. So I think that notion of giving yourself permission, that's, that's really important. Thanks, Lindsay. I was just going to agree with Lindsay. I mean, cause I'm a structure person. It's like, I kind of have this plan in my head about what's going to happen and build some flexibility in for it, into it for f- people to come to you and freak out. <laughs> cause that's what we do. Um, but honestly, just like, okay, if I have to get something done at eight o'clock, that's okay. And, you know, for folks that need that structure, it, it has been hard, but I think that's been very healthy too. So I was just going to agree. That's all. Some, something that I brought up <clears throat> at a recent kind of all company meeting was just, just being explicit about <laughs> people who are trying to uh, figure out what to do with the school situation. You know, people have different circumstances at home and, and there's a lot that do have kids and, <clears throat> or they have grandkids that, you know, they're still sorting all that. And I just want to, I just put it out there that it's going to get real stressful and you might see people behaving a little bit differently around that as they're trying to make those decisions and right. Feel somewhat comfortable with the uncertainty or completely uncomfortable with this uncertainty and, and just brought up that, you know, people need to be willing to speak up to their leader and their team if they need to renegotiate some of those operating agreements, because if, you know, summer is summer and we yeah. haven't been trying to help our kids with homework or, you know, those sorts of things. And if that's going to change rather than suffering in silence, right, just have that conversation and be yeah. overt to say, I, I need to be a parent teacher between nine and 11 pretty much every day. So I'm going to be less available. <laughs> if you don't hear from me, I will follow up. But then everybody right. understands and, and can actually be supportive and encouraging to that person versus, you know, where, where the heck did they go? They're, you know, they're never responding. Yeah. Yeah. Ruby and I were on a call with uh, a leader this week um, and she was, you know, s- sort of talking about, and we've talked about this here before as well, just the, the, the notion that the line between the two isn't just blurry in some cases, it just doesn't exist, right? You know, I always talk about how we used to try real hard to protect this space when we were on a, a Zoom call or a virtual meeting because that was the workspace. And you didn't have kids or pets or, you know, naked spouses walking through your video like you do now. Um, and in the beginning, that was funny. It was, you know, funny when Jennifer took her laptop to the restroom and we all got to hear that. Um, but now it's just, I think it's, I think it's made people more human to one another. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a good, it's one of the silver linings of, of this work from home culture for the last few months, just because I think we get to know people in a, in a different way. And that's what this leader was talking about. She was like, you know, I know things about coworkers and people that work on my team um, that I just didn't know before, or I didn't appreciate. Right. So if I knew that conceptually you had kids, right, that's one thing, but to know that you have a five-year-old and a three-year-old and I've seen them, (laughs) right. um, Sometimes more than once on a, on the same call, it's, it's different. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think I think we're giving each other in some cases a little bit more a little bit more leeway, a little bit more latitude, but not always giving that to ourself. So that's why I asked Eric to join us today. <laughs> there he is. You, you'll notice you'll uh, notice he does not he does not have his <laughs> trademark handlebars here anymore. And if you're curious as to how that happened, there's a video on his website. You should go watch it. But there is bleeding involved. He did, he did he did rupture himself. So I want to welcome Eric Isle to the program here today. Eric is a business philosopher, expert in human-centric workplaces, uh, and has spent a lot of time dealing with organizational change, organizational culture, um, and work-life balance. Uh, and on top of that, uh, he's he's not only a big thinker, he's a big time record spinner. He's a DJ another career move that he came to, as we say, later in life. 
So with that, I want to welcome Eric to the program. I'm going to stop my share here and we're going to try some technology stuff. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is pin my video. Because if you pin my video, then I'm going to bring Eric into my frame here. And now you should see both of us on a split screen together. And you shouldn't be distracted by the flipping back and forth that Zoom does when people talk when you're in speaker view. So Eric, welcome. Thanks, Eric. Bit, yeah, tell us a little bit about you, your background. Why would anybody care to hear you speak? Uh, that's a fair question. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know, almost three decades of, of working in the corporate world in one way or another. Uh, and, and really focus the whole time on, in, in one way or another on the human experience. Uh, it's, it's always been interesting to me to see how, how employees and customers interact with brands um, mm -hmm. and, and what, that, what that life is like. So I grew up working for General Electric. I, I worked for GE for uh, 10 years. That was my- Was that I in the Jack Welch era? It was in the Jack Welch and then the crossover into Jeff Immel. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was in the, like the six Sigma as a religion era. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, it was a great time to be there, but I consider it to be my MBA. It was, it was definitely where I, I learned a crap ton of the stuff that I later went on to really focus in on and, and, and try to try to understand better. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so worked in, I've worked in pretty much every part of the business from a, from a corporate standpoint. I worked in uh, customer service. I've worked in uh, finance. I've worked in sales. I've worked in IT. Um, I've worked in HR. Um, yeah, yeah. Wow, you've been around the block. Been around the block, yeah. So are there any weird jobs in your history? They're all weird. <laughs> <laughs> things jobs that would are, be surprising. Jobs are weird, right? Um, things that would be surprising. Uh, gosh, uh, I drove a bread delivery truck. Uh, That's pretty weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty fantastic. I, I was, and it was, it was a midnight to like eight a.m. kind of thing. Oh, um, right on. I would, I would drive around and deliver bread and pastries uh, at the pre-dawn hours <laughs> so <laughs> you you have other weird things in your life you dj now that's and true you dj you dj in a character that is also true yeah yeah and, and and this character has pretty much has his own identity yeah i'd say that's fair he's become he's become an alter ego yeah i think that's true yeah yeah so yeah. T tell us about this this character this alter ego person yeah. Uh, so, uh, so his name is DJ Savior Breath, um, and, uh, and Savior as in as in our Lord and Savior. That's Savior. correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I started I started DJing, um, gosh, eleven ish years ago, um, and uh, decided that I didn't just want to be the dude who showed up like. Hey, I'm too old to be the dude who shows up with like the snapback cap and the, you know, like <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not that guy. Um, and B, I just thought it was boring. Like I wanted to do something different, so I so I created this character called DJ Savior Breaths, and uh, I picked the name first because I just think the pun is funny. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then I decided, well, what would what would DJ? I asked myself, what would DJ Savior Breath look like? Um, and so, so, what does he look like? Uh, you know, I, th I, th I was sure you were just going to pull up a picture just then, Eric, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he's, uh, he's a, he's a Pope, Bishop, Cardinal, but also none of those things. Um, he does wear a, he does wear a miter though. Um, <laughs> so that's the, yeah, that's the, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about DJing, I'm going to broadcast from the record in the back here. <laughs> I'm taking this off because it clashes horribly with the red shirt. <laughs> so, so you developed this character, you started doing this thing. And, and, you know, I, I was, I was watching your videos last week and I noticed that you did an ignite video. Yeah. Um, 
that introduced this this concept of of mashing up your work and your life, um, which is sort of in line with with your professional side. But you yeah. did it. You did it from the DJ character, which I thought was kind of brilliant. Um, Thank you. So so tell us a little bit about how DJ Save Your Breath became connected with the yeah. work that you do and the things that you believe in. Yeah, so so I for a long time like uh kept these two things very separate. So I and there were actually there were three things because I was also a music journalist. So I wrote about music for Westward and the Denver Post for a whole bunch of years. I kept that very separate from the fact that I was working in in, in corporations at the time as an employee, a uh, full-time employee. Um, and so I kept the DJing very separate as well. So like mm-hmm. DJ Save Your Breath was a thing I didn't really talk about at work, you know. Um and uh and but but as a DJ, the thing that I always love to play is our, our mashups. And for people who don't know what a mashup is, it's basically two or more songs brought together uh, in a way that sort of reveals a whole new work of art. Uh, and sometimes they're funny uh, the, because the because the uh, the contrast between the music is funny. Uh, sometimes they're just like, oh, wow, that's just that made that song so much better. Um, mm-hmm. So I was really interested in, in mashups just in music. Uh, but but in parallel, I had I had started really focusing on on helping folks with work life balance and helping myself with work life balance. And I, I started to see this parallel between the idea of a mashup, which is basically bringing together all these elements to create something new um, and the idea of, of work and life. Um, mm-hmm. it, it had become pretty clear to me that for most of us, work-life balance isn't really a metaphor that works very well. Um, and so the idea of work-life mashup started to make more sense to me. And so I started to explore that and I needed DJ Save Your Breath's help um, to, to, <laughs> to figure that out. And uh, figure he's out good at mashups. Out. He's he's good at mashups, right? Right, right. He's good at finding the mashups anyway. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I love that. I, I love the way you know traditional mashups. Uh, you know, you think about when that phenomenon first started happening. It was an instrumental and a vocal, right, yeah. from two different songs that you put together. But yeah. DJ does it a little differently. He 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 messes with with pitch and tempo and all sorts of different elements to create a mashup. It's not just one song's music and another song's vocal. It's blending the the two songs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. To, to sort of draw that out into that sort of work life mashup concept, really like uh, you can, any, anybody, anybody here today can make an awful mashup. Like you can make an absolutely terrible mashup. You can just play two songs at the same time and it's terrible. Right. Um, but the mashups that work, uh, the producer has had to alter pitch, has al- had to alter tempo, has had to create something that's harmonious, um, mm. and that actually that actually works together and is uh, synergistic, to use a horribly overused corporate word. Um, <laughs> but 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 I mean it in this case, um, where where you really do bring together these multiple sources, and you have to kind of t- tweak them to make them mm. fit together. Uh, and that's where I feel like with with the work life mashup, and it's beyond just it's beyond just sort of professional and personal. It's also your spiritual and your uh, mm-hmm. you know your family and your uh, volunteer work and whatever all the things are that are you. Um, it's a the, the work life mashup becomes about like how do you how do you get the right mix and how do you how do you tweak the faders uh, to make it something that's actually harmonious and helpful. Yeah. So, so how are you doing that, you know, in, in the, in the work-life balance arena, in the organizational culture arena and in, in customer experience? Cause I know you, you spend a lot of time in your other job in that customer experience space. So yeah. how does this mashup concept apply in those different arenas? Well, I, th- I think, I think it all comes down to this, this, this term that you alluded to at the, at the beginning, which is the idea of, of human centric work. Um, Mm. and I think, and I think this is, this is something that I've really been thinking about a lot lately, uh, because a lot of people come to me and ask me about, you know, how can we become a more customer centric organization? Right. Right. I mean, everybody's saying that, right. Um, and then there might be some organizations that are starting to say, how can we be employee centric? Right. And and Mm -hmm. that's a thing too, but both of those paradigms, like, I feel like are reductive of humans. Um, Mm -hmm. they put us into a role. 
right? We are a customer or we are an employee. Um, and I think that's bullshit, right? We are, we are all humans, right? And we are complex, creative individuals, all of us in our own way. And so, so to me, this notion of the work-life mashup comes into the workplace um, and says, how do, we, how, do we look at, how do we look at our employees as not employees, but as humans first? Uh, how do we look at our customers as not customers, but as, but as humans first? Um, and I think this stuff really starts to matter, right? Because, uh, you know, one of the, one of the great achievements and also curses of modern marketing is the notion of segmentation. Um, mm-hmm. and so, you know, we segment customers and now we segment employees as well. Right. And, and, uh, and that's helpful. It's a useful, like heuristic. Uh, but the fact is what really matters is like that individual, right? The individual is like the unit of change and the unit of, of what matters in the workplace. So, so to me, this work-life mashup thing, uh, comes into the organizational culture to say, what do we have to do? What does an organization have to do to really indicate that, that we are human centric, um, mm-hmm. and not just customer or employee? Yeah. So I, I love that idea. You know, you, you, we talked the other day and you defined business as just humans interacting, right? And yeah, I, human, I, humans serving humans. It's just humans serving yeah. humans. Yep. Which, which I love, you know, Morag always, she tells a story about how early in her career, you know, she was told, leave your relationship stuff at the door. This is business. It's not personal. And, and, you know, we kind of had a lot, we, we have a laugh about that all the time because everything is personal because we're actually people. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. putting that in the front is, is not a thing that comes naturally to everybody what what is what are some of the things that you advise businesses to do or or, or when you're you know working on a, a culture project to even allow that to be a, a thought that enters the the sphere right that that this is the the base of of, of the way we think here yeah i mean i i think it i think it's you know it, i i always i always like to start the conversation with strategy first uh with with what the heck are you trying to accomplish um mm-hmm. And then, and then, the, and then the how. So I, I, I have, I have learned that you don't start the conversation with culture. Um, <laughs> you start the conversation with culture <laughs> through um, and, uh, and and you know what? What I find really interesting when you when you start looking at it, you know, you look at the. I'll, I'll start at one extreme. One extreme is uh, command and control, right? So or. Yeah. I like to call it command and illusion of control because you know, <laughs> don't actually have any control. Um, but uh, because human, as it turns out, humans are semi-autonomous uh, beings. What? Right? Um, I know, I know. <laughs> Notice I said semi-autonomous though. Yeah. So. Um, but uh, but yeah. So so uh, so if if you take command and control, like command and control is actually really effective at getting a certain set of results, especially in the short term. Yes, and 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 in a crisis, for example, it can be super yeah. useful. Right? Buildings on um, fire. It's a really effective leadership strategy. Absolutely. Um, as a as a leadership philosophy, um, it gets really limited results. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I, I just if you if we if we think about what it means to have actually engaged people in a workplace, uh, those are people who are actually committed to. And excited about what they're what they're there to do, right? Um, you don't get people excited, enthused, and committed by telling them what to do. You can right. get them to do that yeah. thing. That's what right. you can get. Um, and best. So, <laughs> yeah, and so so as I always say, like you can use that, like you can use that management approach, and that's going to get you a certain set of results, <laughs> but it's going to be a limited set of results. Like versus, if you get people enthused and engaged and excited then what can they contribute? Like they are going to, they're going to bring way freaking better ideas. Um, they're going to, they're going to operate at a higher level uh, than they are bec- do, by doing what you told them to do. Um, mm-hmm. then, then they're just, a, then they're just a means of production. And that's, that's not, that's not the work, yeah. the workplace that I want. <laughs> that, that's a terrible phrase, right? A means yeah. of production. Yeah. I think it's I like mean, I think it's, human resources. Really? It's, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Human capital management. Yeah, it's a, oh, these are not, terrible. These are not these are not terms that that actually respect humans at all. Yeah, yeah. Why not just call them Soylent Green? It's people. <laughs> it's really dating myself. Yeah. So so 
So command and control on the one end of the spectrum, you know, how do you move people towards uh, away from that end and into this more, this more human centric space, especially, you know, sort of starting with what you're trying to accomplish. Um, what, what are the things that you do to, 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 to sort of present this idea that may be, that may be foreign to some of these command and control type of folks? Yeah. I mean, I, I, the, what do I do? I, uh, I have a lot of conversations um, and, and the conversations t- tend to a lot of times be as, as everybody does in this, in this uh, room today. Uh, but, but I think a, a lot of those conversations are about what are the results you're getting now? Yeah. And what are the results you need to get? Right. Um, and, and, and then to dig into, and, and this is where it gets, this is where I think it gets really interesting because uh as it turns out, most humans <laughs> come to work and they try to do what they think is expected of them. Mm-hmm. Like barring a handful of sociopaths, most people come to work <laughs> and, and try to do what they think is expected of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is that they come to that belief, that assumption about what's expected of them through all the things that they experience at work, right, over time. Uh, through what they learn, not from what they're told necessarily, but from what they right. observe and experience, right? And and so they they start to form these sets, this set of assumptions in, about how they're supposed to behave, how they're supposed to, how they're expected to perform. And that's where, like, I think the work gets really interesting is is trying to understand what is it that people believe is expected of them, um, and then what do you want people to believe is expected of them? Uh, and there's often a there's often a pretty big gap. Uh, mm-hmm. when you, when you, when you look at those, when you look at those, those things. Um, and so, so the, so the goal with the goal in conversations that I have with leadership is let's get, let's get in and let's try to actually understand your current culture by trying to understand what actually people think is expected of them, because that's, what's driving their current behavior. Um, and that's an, actually a fairly invasive process um, yeah. <laughs> um, to understand what people believe is expected of them. And, um, you know, I use a set of tools to do that. Um, but it's uh, but to, but to me, it's it's the interesting conversation is, is actually to start with the ideal. Let's start with what we want people to believe is expected of them. Um, let's, let's start with what we want people to think we, we value. Um, and then let's measure what, what people actually think we value. Mm. Um, and then let's understand that gap. And, uh, and, then, and then understand the, the, the links between the, those gaps and the outcomes we're getting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, which are, and those outcomes are often what people call culture. Um, but that culture really, to me, is, is, at the, is in those beliefs, like what people yeah. think is expected of them. Yeah, I, I love that idea. You know, we, we always say you're, you're going to get a culture. You- yep. You, you might as well have some influence over what that culture is actually going to be. So I, I, lo- I love this notion of, of this human centric focus to org design, to culture design, but I want to kind of pull it back to this work life mashup mm-hmm. concept. Yeah. Um, because I think, I think right now we're, we're kind of living in a mashup. Mm-hmm. Um, everything is, is smashed together. And what, what advice do you have for folks, you know, for folks here on this call, a lot of folks here in, in HR capacities that are dealing with stressed out, anxious employees, employees that, that deal with, um, you know, these, as, as Lindsay brought up early, earlier, right, these sort of self-imposed rules and regulations on how we work and when we work, um, not to mention self-limiting beliefs, you know, you and I talked about this uh, the other day on a conversation around as, as a person trying to figure out how to balance my life, how, how to be a work-life balancer, right? Mm-hmm. You mentioned balance as a verb, which I thought yeah. was pretty cool. Um, yeah. how, do I, how do I deal with all that? And, and what, as an HR person, could I be saying to my employees who are struggling with this, especially in this mm-hmm. crazy paradigm that we're in? That's a that's a great question. I'll I'll, I'll give you I'll, I'll I'll give you two things that I think are useful. So so one is I think I think recognizing that for different for different humans there are different sort of paradigms of work life balance, and and what's right for me may not be right for you. And and there's okay. and I would and I would say there's three 
uh, primary paradigm. So, so the first one is just work-life balance, right? That's the zero sum game. That's if I do more at work, I do less in life. If I do more in life, I do less at work. Right. Um, and for some people that's, that's the healthy spot to be in. I need to have, I need to have clear boundaries. I need to know what is my personal, what's my professional. And, and that's right for some people. And I think, so I think this, 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 helping employees towards self-awareness about this is, is really the first step. So are you a work-life balancer? Are you a work-life integrator? Which is basically like, it's all freaking mashed up, right? It's, it's, yeah. I don't care. I'm, I'm working and I'm, you know, like right now, I think a lot of, a lot of people are in this sort of work-life integration place where we're like, I am working and I'm also homeschooling my kid. Uh, and I'm taking my dog for a walk at the same time. Right? And, and, uh, um, like that's that's right for some people too, right? It's it doesn't carve mm -hmm. up life into little slices. It says, okay, it's just all one thing. Um, but that can also be really exhausting, and especially in some careers. Yeah. Um, and I would say for you, for especially for some of you empaths um, <laughs> who are here today, um, that can get exhausting, right? That can just yeah. drain you completely. Um, sure. And so, so the third paradigm is what I call work life alignment. Um, so that's really saying I'm steering my my whole ship through a clear set of values and priorities and goals. Um, and I see a, a role that my professional life plays in that. I see a role that my family life plays in that. I see a role that my volunteer work plays in that, whatever. Right? Um, so that alignment thing is really about saying, okay, I, I have to get clear about what my values, priorities, and goals are in order to do that. Um, but then I start to focus on... Um, through all of those different domains of my life, what am I contributing to the world? Um, and where does that, where does that contribution come from? So that's, that's the, that, that leads me to kind of the second thing I wanted to share. So if you've got those three paradigms, work-life balance, work-life integration, work-life alignment, which is useful. Um, and then I think, as you said, you know, so, so if work-life balance thing, uh, the notion of, of this as a, as a verb, as a thing we're constantly doing, not as a state that we achieve, right. um, in order to do that, in order to do anything active like that, we have to have some kind of practice that that mm. centers us and guides us, right? And I like this is this is something I think is so key is that any of the, any of these sort of principles that we value greatly, we have to figure out how do we practice it, how do we how do we do it? Yeah. Um, and so for for work life balance, one of one of the things that I that I have found really helpful. Um, uh, does anybody here keep a to do list? Anybody have a to do list? everybody right and to-do lists are awesome for productivity right for, for just getting shit done like you just check stuff off i'm doing stuff i'm doing stuff i'm doing stuff and that's useful um but it's focused on busyness it's yeah. it's it's really it's really outcome oriented and it's and it can really tear you away from any kind of work-life balancing yeah, you can fill a to-do list full of meaningless tasks. At the end of the day, feel like you were really, really productive, and you did nothing. And you did nothing, right? <laughs> you did nothing, and um, and so and so. I think I think that you know I think productivity is is meaningful and important. Um, but then I've, I, I've I've been sort of inspired by. Does anybody here do gratitude journaling? Mm -hmm. I may do a gratitude journal uh, sometimes, says Lori. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm interested in that because, because, you know, we've seen the research, right? Gratitude journaling really helps you cultivate a positive mindset. Uh, it's got this sort of Viktor Frankl kind of thing to it, right? Where we start to see the meaning and things. Um, uh, so it's really good for, for, for gratitude, but, but I'm interested in a, a practice like that, that can help us with work-life alignment. Um, and I, I, I mentioned before this focus on, on what am I contributing? Um, so I'm so I am advocating for the notion of a contribution journal, uh, where at the end of each day I can sit down and write down three ways I contributed today, and I love that could, this. This could be and and the contribution can be big or small. This is what's really important, right? Like like it could be I asked a good question in a meeting, like that really you know focused the conversation. It could be I washed the dishes that have been sitting in the sink for freaking days. Um, it, you know, it, it could be, <laughs> go Eric, um, uh, and, and, it, and it could be, you know, I, I, I sent a message to employees that, that really resonated and was helpful to them. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. What matters is that focus on what am I contributing 
um, yeah. and looking at it in multiple domains of life. Like I contributed by, you know, uh, mowing the neighbor's lawn because I was already mowing my lawn and, and who cares or uh, whatever it is. But I think, I think that's, if you can cultivate contribution as a practice, that can help focus on that alignment of the piece. Um, so yeah. I, I, lo- I love that. I love that for a couple of reasons. One, right, this notion of work-life alignment um, and sort of getting your ducks in a row. Um, but, but, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a depression kid and I deal with this concept of self-limiting belief always, every day, all day long. And <clears throat> gratitude journal right? That's helpful, right? We know that that works. Research has borne that out. Um, But a gratitude journal is inside out. I'm grateful for you. I'm Mm -hmm. grateful for the experience that I had with another person in a certain environment. This notion of contribution journal, I got to turn that around. And I've got to acknowledge myself for doing something. So for me to, to, to use that as a practice to not only ensure that I'm contributing in all the facets of life that I want to be contributing in. But I also have to acknowledge the efficacy of those contributions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that when, when, when you, when you first unloaded this on me, it blew my mind because I, I, it's a, it's a concept that, that I've never thought about. And you, you explain it so eloquently and so simply um, and I think I think there are are several levels on which this notion of of identifying and 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 stating out loud right into the into the ether uh, of your notebook or your voice recorder or however you do it, um, it it helps it helps fill your bucket not only from a am I present in all the spaces I want to be in context, but in a I can actually do this shit context. Which I think, yes. you know, as as I've been sort of just chomping on on the conversation that we had prior to this call, that's the thing for me that I've been like, wow, right? Giving yourself the space and grace <laughs> to be where you are and acknowledge that, you know what, as human beings, we're really bad at assessing how shitty something is going to be in the future. Right. Right. And to be able to acknowledge our contributions to it along the way, I think is fantastic. I, I think, I think you, you've struck gold here with this contribution journal concept. Thanks, man. Well, and I, I love, what, I love what you just picked out. Thank you for, thank you for that insight because I, I, I do think that one of the, one of the underlying, the underlying mission for me um, is, is always about agency and self-efficacy. And so like to, to what extent does each of us feel like we have, uh, some sort of control over what we do and over what happens to us. And I feel like the greatest thing that we can do from a human centric perspective is to, is to cultivate that in ourselves and then encourage other people to cultivate that, right? That notion that, cause it's easy to be freaking victimized. It is absolute because there are things that are out of our control and there are things that happen to us for sure. Um, sure. But I think that I think what you what you just hit on is absolutely the the underlying point for me, which is that which is that we've got to be able to to feel some sense of agency in our lives, and, and I think the contribution focus allows us to say, what little thing can I do that's of service to somebody else? Lori, <laughs> you're muted. We can't hear you, Lori. Okay, can you hear me? Now? Hardware. Yep. Yes. Hi. Okay, so where? In this concept, because I also love the the contribution piece, because that's such a inside the control circle (laughs) piece. Where do you see asking for help when you need Uh, it in this uh, concept? Because I've been reading and, and kind of hearing about people who are givers have a super hard time asking for help and have judgment about needing, but actually when you acknowledge that needing is okay and actually valuable to express, you're actually authentically giving in in a different frame. 
So how does that how does that fit in your context? That's a beautiful question. I, I, I love that. I I don't I don't know that I've thought that through, Laurie. So I'm not going to bullshit you. Um, uh, <laughs> but I I think I think it's I think it's a fascinating question and and one worth asking. And I think I think it's also in, an interesting uh, if you if you put that in an organizational context. I think I think it's, this gets really interesting too because uh, we do have certain uh, I have certainly observed certain cultures. Uh, where people believe they are not expected to ask for help. Mm-hmm. People believe they're expected to take care of everything. Um, and figure it out. And well, figure and it out. And it's, it's seen as weakness. Or that's right. Either, yeah. either in ourselves or we're told yeah. that that's weak, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that's that's interesting. I, I, wonder, I wonder if there's room to... Um, Part of part of that, I think, is, is and I'm gonna, I'll, this is a this is a catchphrase, and I don't and I'll go deeper. But I think part of it's about that sort of culture of learning, right? Um, and what are the things that we do to indicate that we that we value a culture of learning? That that, that, that that's that that's what we expect people to do. That we expect people to learn and grow. Um, and I think you know some of that has to do with modeling, you know, with asking mm-hmm. for help. Um, uh, some of it has to do with you know, the, the flip side of strengths based, which is also saying like, here's what I'm not good at and probably not going to get good at. and don't really even necessarily even want to get good at, (laughs) please help me. Right. Um, but I think, but I think, so I think modeling is a, is a piece of that, but I think there's also, again, I think, I think if we come down to to practices and rituals, what are the things that we can do in our, in, within cultures that, that start to say, no, that's what we value. We value people, uh, knowing their strengths, knowing their weaknesses, knowing when they need to ask for help. Mm-hmm. And we value people who ask for help as much as we value the helpers. Um, mm-hmm. So that could, that can be little rituals. Right. And I think, uh, I think the, I, I think of the Gretchen Rubin quote, which is that, you know, what, what you do every day matters way more than what you do once in a while. Um, so what are the things that we can inject into, I was just talking to a company yesterday. Uh, they were telling me that they, you know, they have a daily stand up meeting, right. Um, and in that daily stand-up on Tuesdays, it's Learning Tuesday, and every one member of the team is assigned to bring a new thing uh, for everybody oh, cool. to read, a TED Talk for people to watch, whatever it is, right? But it says that by having that ritual built in yeah. says that we want people to learn, and we know that you're not done. I love <laughs> you're, that. Right? I love that so much, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. But thank you for that question. I'm going to think, I'm going to think more about that. That's great. Cool. Yeah. That was an awesome question. What other questions do you have for Eric crew? This is where I need the jeopardy music, Eric. Let that silence ride. That's right. Awesome. Well, if you do have questions, oop, there's Ruby. She's got a question. No, I'm just I'm thinking a lot about um, this notion of work-life balance and integrator and I'm looking at my notes and alignment. And I'm definitely, the way my brain works, I feel like I'm very compartmentalized. And so, and definitely have that empath piece going in that, like, I feel like I need real separation mm. in that. And in this current existence, like I'm getting pushed on that. And I think there's a way for me to get better at living my life and, and maybe shifting out of that balance mindset. Um, so I'm kind of talking out loud because I, I'm just, yeah. it's resonating with me in this. I do think in, in separate buckets. It's just the way my brain works. Do you think there's any value right now in shifting that mindset? I mean, I, I mean, you're 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 going to be pushed. I think I, I think you said it right. You're already being sort of forced to to integrate more. Um, but I I mean, I think I, I I also would say that there's that there's that there's value in knowing what your tendency is, right? So so for you, you you look at your life and you say, look, I've got 1,440 minutes in the day. Uh, how am I going to divide up those 1,440 minutes? Um, and I don't have. I don't have infinite time. Time is not a renewable resource. Um, so I think there's, I think there's, there's value in knowing that that's kind of where you come from, and yeah. then figuring out what are the, what are the practices that you need to put in place in order for that to, in order for that to work. Um, and I think about Morag starting with this idea of like, of like having airplane time, right? Like that's mm-hmm. that's a, that's a that's a work-life balancer kind of uh, strategy. Um, 
that says I need to take, I need to carve off a, a piece of time and, uh, and, uh, and, and just make that about one thing. Um, and I, and so I think, I think for you, like, I wouldn't say like, just go headlong into integration or alignment. I, I wouldn't say that that's actually going to be helpful to you. Um, uh, but I think there's, I think there's things to learn, right? So, so mm. each of those three paradigms has something to learn from the other. Um, so when you, if you're a work-life balancer, what can you, what, what pieces of the integrator can you, can you borrow? What pieces of the aligner can you borrow, um, that are going to make you, uh, a little bit more effective in this context right now. Well, and I think just on the basis of our team that I have shifted and like, I'm not so boxy, you know, and, um, and it's made our team more effective to it, you know, being able to serve my team in a different way, but making sure that on the back end, like Eric said, counting the time when you're not sitting at your desk from eight to five, right? And making sure you're counting that time. So you're taking the breaks instead of just working more. That's where I get into trouble. It's like I work mm -hmm. in the box and then I work beyond the box. So. <laughs> right. And, you know, and yeah. something something that we talk about at Cable Labs because a big focus for us is innovation. And the, the concept is that innovation doesn't happen between eight and five sitting at your desk. Actually, right. your best ideas might be Saturday at 10 a.m. on a mountainside, right? And and that's okay. That's actually, right, you, you need that space. Because if you try to put yourself in that box of, right, what, whatever you're trying to create or do, um, it doesn't work that way. And so sometimes it's because you're somewhere else that that inspiration comes or you're able to noodle on the thing that you've been taking notes about. And so, it, you know, embrace that. That's, that's why we have an unlimited PTO policy because people are working and doing whatever they're doing. Right. And we shouldn't have to count that in hours. Yeah. 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 It's like the shower thoughts idea, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Best ideas come in the shower. Awesome. A any other questions for Eric? Dude, this has been so fun. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for so having much, me. So much fun. Lori put your uh, the link to your mashup video. Uh, oh, nice. That, nice. Well, Thanks, the link to DJ's Save Your Breath's uh, mashup video uh, yes. in the chat. And, and everybody should check it out. It, it's super fun. And you have a new words with friends word now because that is a miter. That's a miter. <laughs> right. R-E, not E-R. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. All right. I'm going to shift back here. You guys can unpin me and I'm going to put my deck back up so we can do the funny stuff and then get on out of here. All right, here we go. Deck is going back up. Um, did it go back up? Can you guys see the deck? Yep. Yes. Excellent. All right. Today's funny stuff. Today's funny stuff is all about cats because I'm thinking about getting a cat and it's just kind of my thing. Funny thing number one. Um, meanwhile, in Iceland, this is, this is, I can't even read this name in Icelandic. Um, mousekeeping. Mousekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> because we all need that. The next one. Me, I'm going to the bathroom. My cat. We are going. <laughs> My cat figured out how the fridge works, and now he's turnt on fresh, crisp water. <laughs> but my my favorite one of the day. Have you seen Brian? Last seen gambling and hanging out with the wrong crowd. Always hanging around girls. Don't approach him until he's had his coffee and do not lend him money. Don't tell him you're calling me. Brian hates snitches and has no time for nerds. <laughs> he just tell me where he is and what he's up to. Oh, wow. Brian. <laughs> and today's semi-quarantine cocktail is the, yeah, I said it, seeds. This is a riff on a cocktail called the Chinese Whisper. It's two ounces of citrus vodka and then what the fuck are these seeds? Have you guys heard about these seeds? Oh. A little bit of lychee liquor, liqueur. Um, do they grow murder hornets? Some <laughs> ginger syrup. And seriously, people in all 50 states have received unsolicited seeds from China. 
<laughs> what the fresh hell is that about? <laughs> a little bit of root ginger, muddle the ginger, shake it like you mean it, strain it into a glass, and don't put any weird seeds into it. Yeah, check it out. Seeds are being sent unsolicited to mailboxes across the United States right now. And it's probably the most bizarre thing um, in a normal year. It would be the weirdest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> in 2020, it's just a thing that's happening. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to Eric for being here today and, and sharing sharing his ideas and his wisdom. I love this notion of the contribution journal. I actually have my gratitude journal and I split it and I started the back half to be my contribution journal. And my goal is to alternate days. I'll gratitude one day, I'll contribution nice. the next day. Nice. Um, because oh, I love God. the idea. I think the idea is, is, is so big and has, has so much power behind it. Um, we look forward to seeing where you take it and we want to be there for your book launch. So. Thanks, man. Thank you all for, for being here today. It's been really fun. Thanks, awesome. Eric. You. Appreciate yeah. it. All right, I'll guys. see you all again. You guys have a great evening. Thank you so much, Eric. We'll talk soon. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Eric. Bye. Bye. Eric. Bye. See you guys. Bye.